right now. Okay. Is it streaming and being uploaded to like YouTube? Uh, no, I have yeah. to upload it later. Yeah, later. No, but is it going to be uploaded? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. All of the classes put are. The thing up on All the of famous them so far. Today is the 16th of March. Can you put the address again? Harry Wizard. Or you can see it on YouTube. Okay. My mom, my mom wanted to see so. Cool. It's right there. It's very clear. Anything you say will be taken down and used in evidence against you. That's okay. Right, on April the 13th, we have no class. You're aware of that, right? The 13th, when we get to April the 13th, that's Christian Workers Seminar in Tennessee. So we have then a few more weeks to go, like uh, next week would be the 23rd. Skip the stuff about the visions. I, I apologize for not getting this right initially, but playing a little bit by ear, you see, I want to know where you all are in all of this. So as long as we cover this book, we're all right. Then the 30th you come, April the 6th, 13th you don't come, 20th you come, and the 27th. What in the world is May the 4th? We haven't anything done for that. Anyway. Final. And in the final, you either preach a resounding sermon on what you think the gospel is in the kingdom, anything related, or if you prefer to write. No, I'm not trying to preach. We won't ask. We won't ask the race what she's going to do. We'll wait and be surprised. She'll get up and thunder at us. You can tell all the men what to do. Okay. <laughs> no. So that's coming up and then that's it you are expected on May the 11th to, to, to produce a final research paper of some sort right so that's in addition to, to speaking or writing so some something that shows what you've picked up on this I think very easy topic so a written paper from all of you on the 15th May the 11th sorry May the 11th and uh, we'll have on May the 4th we'll do our either speaking or writing an essay. You know, so if you're not speaking, then you'd be obliged to write two things. If you are speaking, you only have one paper to write. You can write 50 pages if you like. 25 will do. <laughs> See how we go with that. Okay, let's pray this morning, folks. Our Father in heaven, we address you as the creator of all things, the one soul, incomparable God of Israel, the God of Jesus, the God of David, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, we're grateful for another day of life in this beautiful spring coming here in Georgia. We thank you for these students, the enthusiasm and the energy that they have, and we pray a blessing on their ongoing ministry as it develops in different ways. We pray for the state of the world, which is quite tragic, and we're praying your kingdom come because Jesus commanded us to do that. We thank you, Lord Messiah, for dying on the cross for us, that we can have freedom from our sins. Help us to be good disciples and students of the kingdom message, the gospel message of salvation. We commit this time into your hands now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, let's start with what you read, which was that thing about Gnosticism. What is Gnosticism, would you say, Nathan? Um, you on the spot? I think it's probably, the way I describe it, is uh, it's a school of uh, philosophic... Greek thought, yeah, absolutely. That really right. is into uh, what, taking away what the Bible teaches. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Namely, that of the resurrection. Absolutely, that's that's very good. So Gnosticism is a world way of thinking, heavily influenced by Platonism, as you know. Gnostic means knowledge, right? So it's all about knowledge, but it isn't biblical knowledge from our angle. Um, so it's a dangerous thing. The influence of Gnosticism, we had a quote or two. I want you to know that we're dealing with this day by day. There are folk writing to us as Christians saying, I don't think the second coming is really in the future. I think it will happen in 78. That's called preterism. So people in a big muggle, quite frank, in some of these areas. So if you're dealing with Gnosticism, it has no resurrection, right? Why? Because all of your souls are immortal. That's a good line from the devil, or a bad line, right? That's clear. So you don't need a resurrection. The first thing that goes is the resurrection of the dead. Not so much Christ's resurrection, that tends to go too, but our resurrection. So I think we have to keep that completely in place. So what would be the verse, if you're meeting a preterist, that's a pastist, a past 
highest is. Highest is. Highest person. Preterism, I don't like the term, it gives it too much dignity. But what would be your A key verse? Many, but can you think mm. of one that immediately connects the parousia, the second coming, with the resurrection? Oh, uh, first Thessalonians 4. That's very good. And that will start well. That one doesn't work. Maybe this one does. First Thessalonians 4. Yep. And another one. Revelation 19. Ah, yeah. Revelation 19. That's the coming of Christ in glory. And then another one in Revelation. What's that? Yours is 11, 15 to 18. And Could you use John 5? Yes, you can too. John tends to be a little bit more manipulable, so I don't know where yeah. to start there, but you can. You want to read the verse in John that you had in mind? Sure. In the Bible? Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that on the one. gravel here. Yes, absolutely. And then the one that I had in mind, where we tend always to start. 15 of Corinthians. Yeah, the whole chapter, but particularly verse 23. So let's just look at this. What we're now establishing is the fact of the resurrection, not only of Jesus, but also of the saints, right? That's the first area of Satan's attack, as far as I can understand. And Gnosticism allows you to say that we have an immortal soul that goes on living, right? That's going to put you a little bit at odds with the Billy Graham system. Because as you go to funeral services in America, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that they always put the person in heaven or in hell. With the exception of our SDA friend here, who's learned something different. She's learned it the same way as we have. But mostly, They've gone home. And worse, they say, oh, this child died tragically. God took that child home. I don't think so. The child died for whatever cause. I don't think God wanted another angel, as I've heard that. God wanted another angel. He took that child, killed it, said, oh, that's just wrong. All of that is Gnostic. And so I think you'll find the New Testament fight is fighting Gnosticism. In fact, Paul said that. Beware of the errors and confusions of knowledge Falsely so called. What's that verse? Hmm. Use the magic machine. To tell Timothy. Me. Yes, it's in Timothy. Can somebody find me the exact verse? First Timothy. And we do not want to Timothy as well. What's the one in Timothy which says, Beware of Gnosticism? Beware of knowledge falsely so called. Siri, Google search, Beware of knowledge falsely so called. Yeah. You got it? Oh. He spoke. I don't even have to type it. Terrifying. 6.20. First Timothy, 6.20. Okay, just read the verse for us uh, clearly so we have it. Okay. Paul is warning against Gnosticism. It reads. It reads. Thank you. What do you got? O oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge. Right, so Satan is always active to destroy your faith. If you're shepherds, pastors, elders, you know, they're the same thing. In the Bible, it's one rank. Elders, overseers, pastors, bishops, they're all the same thing. You could have a senior pastor, I'm sure. You know, you could always have one person in charge. Or you could pay one and not pay the others, or pay none of them, all sorts of options, right? But overseers, that's what you are potentially, overseers, elders. Uh, in, in my thinking, the women were not ordained. I'll just make from my angle. I, I think you have to be the husband of one wife to be ordained. However, I think the women should teach. The women in 1 Corinthians 14, I mentioned that. You have to work it out on your own, perhaps. But uh, he says that the women should pray and prophesy. Remember that? Pray and prophesy. Well, I don't think they're just prophesying at home around the kitchen table. <laughs> I, I don't think that's right. Otherwise, were the gifts given only to the women? I don't. Th I mean, to the men. That seems absurd to me. Although I don't think we have the gifts quite like that. It's another subject. I see that. If if uh, you speak to me in a language I know you don't know. I mean, if Anna were suddenly to burst forth in German and she doesn't know German, I'll believe it. I will. I told you I was talking one day and I said, now if you, I turned to the man here and said, if you speak to me in fluent German right now, I'll believe it. It's a miracle. So he did. He just lived in Germany the year before that. That was, that was a fun moment. That was up in Minnesota. That's fun. 
So I, I'm, I'm a realist, and if you're going to claim that you've just raised the dead, I, I want just a little proof of that. I'm not going to doubt it. If you know, if you raised the dead yesterday, I'm going to I'm going to say hallelujah. That's one. I'd love to see more of it. I wish I could do it more often. I wish I could lay hands on everybody and they all get well. I don't think I'm failing. You know, I've asked God often, if I'm, am I doing something so wrong here that I'm not doing all that? Now? I can allow God to do the spectacular at Pentecost where he doesn't have to repeat that every Sunday. Otherwise, why doesn't the building shake when you pray? Does it shake when you pray? <laughs> no, it doesn't shake when we pray in our hearts. Why doesn't it shake right now? I can handle it. God doesn't have to put out the balloons to open the show you know, every time. So something like that. But you're going to run into all of these issues. You know, somebody says, well, they speak in language. <clears throat> I'm not saying you can't. God can do anything you like, but I want some evidence that it really is a language. So people say, oh, well, you're a cessationist, or they mispronounce it. You're a sensationist. No, no. The word is cessationist. No, I'm not saying those things have ceased, but I want some evidence for them being genuine. That's the difference, you know. That's quite a good way to go then you can say, all right, if you really believe that you have the gift of language, have you ever obeyed 1 Corinthians 14, 13, which says, let the one who has this gift pray that they may interpret. Ah, that makes a lot of people go very quiet. They've never done that. I have a line from a very dear friend who's with us in other respects, and he says, I don't know what I'm saying. I speak it all the time. I have no idea what I say. And then, quote, I just babble on, he said. I just babble on. <laughs> I'm going to get back to him. Work, to work, work. I'm not sure that just babbling on is necessarily pleasing to God. You said that was 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians 14.13 yeah. is the key verse to go on this subject. 1 Corinthians 14.13 he said, let the one, it isn't everybody, because earlier he says, do all have the gift of healing? No way. Do all speak in touch? Not at all. Absolutely not. So the Pentecostals say, yes, everybody should or could. Speaking tongues. That, that's hard for me. But uh, 1413 says, Let the one who has the gift of languages pray that he or she can interpret so we can hear what God is saying through you. See? Isn't that beautiful? And then you do 1422 as well. 1422, two verses. 1422, we've got off subject here slightly, but 1422 says that what's the point of tongues? Paul said. Languages. Languages are a sign to. Or unbelievers. Now, if you're convinced that all your babbling in the closet, I'm not referring to you guys here, I think, is that really a sign to unbelievers? Ah, I'm not sure about this. See, I, I swear I work at this. I may be wrong, you know, I'm waiting for more information, but that's what we are. Anyway, <coughs> Gnosticism is a, is a false system of belief which, which is Platonized. I think, rather like today, don't most people believe in evolution? It's kind of in the air, isn't it, almost? It's something you just kind of believe if you're an educated person. That's very dangerous. What about abortion? My wife is working in the anti-abortion writing business. We're having a lady coming to our conference and spends a lot of time doing it. To me, there's nothing to argue about. I, I just, I cannot get my mind around killing a baby in the womb. I, I, can't, I can't even begin to think about it. You might as well ask me to kill myself or somebody else. How dare you? Put an end to a creature there. That's just horrible. And then I use the text where Mary said, Isn't it great that the mother of my Lord came to see me? The mother of my Lord. Elizabeth said, sorry. Elizabeth said. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Elizabeth said. This is great. Mary came to visit her, and Mary was pregnant. Isn't it great that the mother of my Lord Messiah well, that's my Lord Messiah in the womb. You see that? That's uh, Luke 143. That's a great one to squelch. Uh, what if Jesus was aborted? Right. What if Jesus? Or you? Oh, or anybody else? else? Yeah. Or anybody else? I like that. 143. Isn't it marvelous? The mother of my God? No, no, no. Be careful. Don't say the mother of my God. I don't think God gets born. But that's another subject. I know. I know it's a tricky one. <laughs> but it sounds better to say my Lord Messiah there. The mother of my Lord Messiah. Luke 1.43, when you're discussing that. Okay, Gnosticism is paganism mixed with Christianity. False Christianity, obviously. The devil is clever enough to mix. Now I'll give you the text where it says, if you say the resurrection has already happened, <coughs> you've destroyed the faith. Where's that one? Speak to your machine, please. That's a, no. The resurrection has happened. 
Isn't that 1 Corinthians 15? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I thought too. Is it Acts? Mm -hmm. Tell the machine to get it for you. I, I got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> First Timothy. I just read Timothy. How do you think? Yeah. Try 218. Now, I may have it wrong. I may have it wrong. Let's see if her machine will find it. The resurrection has already happened. Second Timothy 218. Got the wrong two. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Second Timothy 218. Just would you, uh, Nathan, read the verse or two in yeah. front of that and the verse up? Just give us the context. This is Gnosticism at work. Then Paul is supposed to. Second Timothy 2. Yep. Sorry, I'm going to that. Mm -hmm. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. Yeah. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Mm -hmm. uh, among them are Hymenaeus mm, uh, and Philetus. He yeah. names these people because they're wrecking the church. Hymenaeus right. and Philetus among them who say, uh, men who yeah. have, oh, these these are men who have gone astray yeah. from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, yeah. and they have set the faith of something. So as Paul says, mark those who cause divisions. Right. Because they're, they're going to kill the, the health of the body of Christ. So that's Gnosticism at work. So our concept here then is that some, from the second century, the Gnostic pagan influence crept into the church and radically changed everything. The immortal soul would be part of that, that you are by nature immortal. So when you die then, your soul has either got to go to heaven or get tortured under the earth. These people come along and say, no, and the SDA is the same thing. They came along and said, no, that's not right. You don't have an immortal soul. When you are dead, you are actually out of it. And you immediately follow with the great text for the resurrection. What's that one? What's your, your primary old text, or Old Testament text for the resurrection? Daniel 12. Daniel 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. We'll start there. Many of those who are sleeping, we've done this routine before, many of those who are sleeping in the dust of the ground will awake some to the life of the age to come, right? Let me run that one more time. Please teach this everywhere. Some will, will wake up to the life of the age. In Hebrew, the chaye olam. Olam is the age. Chaye is the life. The life of the age. The rabbi said correctly, if that's resurrection life, it must be the life of the age to come. We have that in common. That's a beautiful doctrine. Chaye olam. That's Daniel 12, 2. And then that comes into your New Testament as translated poorly as eternal life, strictly the life of the age to come. In my translation, I rendered eternal life, and Bishop Wright does the same, Tom Wright, because uh, that's clear to me, the life of the age to come. You're thinking in a linear fashion, not a vertical fashion. Yeah. Doesn't Jesus, when speaking of the Sadducees, use the resurrection passage from Exodus? He does. Let, let's go there since we're talking about it. Yes, he I does it brilliantly. I couldn't remember where. You're going to find that in Luke 20. Try, try Luke 20. Jesus, our rabbi, not just the guy who died, that's very important because he died and rose, but he's also outwitting them in, Revel in Luke 20. It makes it seem fairly easy. That's how it Well, uh, yes. That's right. He's so much smarter than they are that he makes them look ridiculous. Exodus 3 6. That's correct. I'm looking at Luke 20 to show where he goes back there. 34. Let me start. 34. Jesus said to them, You love this. The sons of this age, right? Hence the age to come and this age, right? The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age, the future age, and the resurrection that goes with it. Isn't that a good one? That age, the future age, the resurrection of the dead. They neither marry nor are given in marriage. Is that clear? You don't reproduce as immortals. I've heard people deny that flat out. I heard somebody say, oh, all, all the immortals are going to bear children. No, it's wrong. Let's get that clear. Immortals don't bear children. That's what he said. So we don't want to contradict that. They cannot even die anymore because they're like angels. Now that would be holy angels because God can finish off unholy angels and will. He will destroy the devil. But he's talking here about holy angels, about the model categories. They're like the angels. For even Moses showed 
in the passage about the burning bush, you gave us that verse, was Exodus 3, 6. 3, 6. 3, 6. When Moses calls the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, how now he is not the God of the dead but of the living for all lived to him now people twist this badly they say there you go <laughs> Abraham is alive you see I, I don't think you read that way do you you see what he's getting at God is the God of the living guess what Abraham's dead therefore <laughs> the resurrection think about that so you, instead of arguing that can't you see of course they're they're still alive right now because right. Uh, because God is saying they're still alive, present tense. Instead, his argument is because it's present tense, that means they're going to be resurrected to life in the Absolutely. future. The argument is how do we prove the resurrection? Not how do we prove that Abraham's alive. He's not alive. In, in, the, uh, oh, in the Hebrew, is that in the perfect or the imperfect? <sighs> which one? Which, which, which phrase? Uh, I am the God. Oh, present tense. I am the God of the living. The thought, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I thought there's no present tense in... Uh, Oh, yes. Yes, there is. Well, yes, there is. I am Yahweh. Actually, that's I will be. What I will be is true. But you can express the present tense in Hebrew. Too. I, I was wondering if, if this wasn't like imperfect, like I will be the God of... Then no, yeah. no, it isn't, of course. It's just, it's Ani. Ani Joseph. I am Joseph. You don't have a, a, a middle uh, word there. Ani Anthony means I'm Anthony. It's me. Ani, I Anthony. So he says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. What he's driving at is, since we all know, and our SDA friends would all agree, 23 million of them, we all know that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are dead, therefore what has to happen? Proof of the resurrection. If God's the God of the living, right, and these people are dead, what has to happen? They have to be raised. From the dead. That's the logic. Now, you wouldn't have thought of using that Bible verse properly. Oh, by the way, why did he use that Bible verse? Because the Sadducees only accepted the, only accepted the first five books of the Bible. So he very cleverly argues on their turf, as we say in English, on their grounds, they accepted only the first five books. And so he argues from those common authorities. So that is beautiful, but I've heard people twist this terribly. They say, well, that proves that Abraham must be alive now then you don't need a resurrection. Got it? Do you see the logic of that? Please think about that carefully. Uh, that's the, the, the clear way to go. All right, so the, the dead are, see, it's 37. But let me prove to you that the dead are raised, verse 37. But that the dead are raised, proof of the fact that the dead are to be raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the book, the burning bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, obviously, when Moses was alive, Abraham was dead, yes? Yes. How can God be the God of the living when Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are dead? God of resurrection. It's, it's very subtle. Beautiful. You don't stumble at that, actually, at all. You see it clearly. A miracle. Eyes are open. It's beautiful. Okay. Now, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all lived him. All are destined to come alive for him in the resurrection. <coughs> okay. Then another question comes down. That, uh, something else. All right, so that's Gnosticism. I think I had a quote or two uh, on that. Uh, J.T. Robinson, I quoted on page 66. This is my cousin John, my mother's first cousin. He was notorious for some of his radical views. Not always quite straight, but anyway, this he said quite interestingly on 66. The whole of our Western tradition has contrived to give death an altogether inflated significance. Isn't there a movie out, by the way, now, about a child going to heaven? I think there's another one. Um, um, heaven, is heaven is for real. Yes. Yes. Is it's, for real. Do you know the story behind that, apparently? No. So, in real life, a child was either, he was either clinically dead or yes. near death. You ever heard of near-death experiences? Yes. And while he was near death or, or dead, he said he went to heaven. You know, when he's supposed to have no brain activity, and that's very common. And so it's, it's strange. To me, that's the devil trying to con contradict the Bible. When people write to me and say, well, there you go. 
No, the child went to heaven. He said he did. Okay, yeah, my problem is that I've got scripture here. And I have to make a choice. There are lots of books like that. You know, that's not the only one. That, that movie, so. And then the problem is when you know, two people contradict each other on what they see. Of course. The question is where they really did. Is this a post-death experience or is it post-near-death, right? Were they really dead if they're still alive to tell the story? Are you saying they were resurrected from the dead? It doesn't make any sense. See, I think the devil is intentional and aggressive with his error. He does it quite deliberately. Otherwise, how do you deceive anybody? But I'm speaking as a conditional <coughs> or talented Facts person. Facts don't care about feelings. Sorry? Facts don't care about feelings. Because facts don't care about feelings. <laughs> You've heard that. That's good. That's very good. So, John Robinson, J.A.T. at Cambridge said, there's been a vastly exaggerated focus on death and the moment of death. It began when the pages of the New Testament were hardly dry. And it's one of the most remarkable silent revolutions in the history of Christian thought. Right? So it creeps in and suddenly everybody's believing it, right? Silent revolution. The whole of our teaching and our hymnology, the way we do our hymn, has assumed that you go to heaven, or of course hell, to be tortured when you die. This proposition is in clear contradiction with what the Bible says. The Bible nowhere says that we go to heaven when we die, nor does it ever describe death in terms of going to heaven. Wesley, John Wesley, the Methodist leader, his words, bid Jordan's narrow stream divide and bring us safe to heaven, is a lie, John Robinson says. I hope I'm not being too tough here. It's false. You don't believe falsehoods, you might as well put cyanide in your coffee. You're killing yourself believing things that aren't true. That's a good quote. So I wrote then at the bottom of this page on 66, the task of evangelical theology must be to eliminate the pagan Greek philosophical element, which is usurped the place of the original Hebraic teaching of the Bible. We must define the kingdom of God as Jesus and the prophets defined it, and abandon our natural Gentile aversion to the messianic hope of future peace on earth with the arrival of the Messiah in glory. Anyway, that's, that's this is very relevant to me. I was at the band practice on Monday, and the horn player, Jim North, very, very friendly. He's an avid Bible student. He's going to the New Hope Baptist Church down the road from where I live. And he's right into this. He says he was a dispensationist, or is a dispensationist. So what do you mean? We got into a long conversation. Well, 20 minutes. So we, had, we closed the doors and we had tea. <laughs> My point to you is this, this is life for me. People's minds have to be educated, I think. Or challenged. If we're all wrong, show us. You know, I'm, I'm willing to change, but this seems to me good, like good stuff. All right. Demythologizing. Right. Now, this is a clever idea. The name connected with demythologizing is Rudolf Bultmann, B-U-L-T-M-A-N-N. And here's the line and, that uh, he produced. And you'll be amazed how much people unconsciously believe this. He said, listen, science, scientifically minded people in the 20th century, this century, they're not going to believe in silly things like resurrection or miracles. Come on. They're just going to believe that. Virgin birth? I mean, forget it. It's stupid. like another form of Gnosticism. Yeah. <laughs> Neo-Gnosticism. Yeah. See, what I'm trying to get over to you guys, because you have some years of ministry ahead of you, if, if the delay in the second coming, I don't know that at all, but this is the life and the world that you're encountering out here. So the idea is, okay, scientific man will not believe rubbish like virgin, but we know that virgins don't have children. Come on, let's get real. This is the devil speaking now, right? There's no resurrection, like, just resurrection. don't even have this faith. Don't even... <laughs> it's clear to you. You know, it's fun with the audiences, you could say, to seven million Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, something that they believe like Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Seven million of them at your door right now as we speak. And you say that to another audience and they'll say, oh, ridiculous. Wait a Seven million people, I say to them, not more or less intelligent than you guys, believe that, right? So you do have a, a, an education task big time, believe me, in changing the minds of people. Otherwise you've got chaos. Now you can reduce the faith to nothing and say, well, as long as we all have love, let's not worry about this. 
doctrines divide, so we don't do doctrines. We just do loving stuff, right? That would be all right if the Bible was simply about just being loving. I, I could do that. But what about Jesus just explaining the resurrection there? Was that just having a good marriage? I, I don't think so. He argues scripture. Paul actually argues scripture. So with Jim North, the horn player, on Monday, I was going through the eight kingdom text with him. And I'll do more. I'll send him stuff now. Because he's, he's involved. He's interested in what we do. We'll see how it goes. Oh, my neighbor came to church. I'll send him. He's a landscaping guy, Matthew Milner, with an African-American wife, and Victoria, he's two, two years old, Victoria, and he came on his own, he wanted to check us out, she might come next Sunday, we'll see if she's scared us, I don't think she would. So we lay on the best possible environments, in my house, a nice, nice setting, it's being filmed, and we're doing Bible study for about an hour and a half, with interaction, people are writing questions from outside, comments, interaction, so it's kind of informal. We'll see what happens next Sunday. Will she come? And I got to thinking, if she's looking for a social environment that is comfortable, forget us. <laughs> we don't have a Sunday school for one two-year-old, right? She's of a different nationality than we are. You know, if you're from Kenya or Britain, you, you really don't worry about that quite as much as, as Americans sometimes do. They say that's not bad. But if she doesn't feel that comfortable, then maybe she won't come. Maybe she will. We'll see. And the other neighbor, on the other side, would you believe this? When I drive here, this is Matthew Milner. On the other side, there's another uh, mixed color marriage It happens. She's a nurse, a white lady. And Orlando is a gentleman of color. And he is uh, an electronics computer guy. So I'm chatting with them. I don't see them very often. When they come and go, I don't know when I'm chatting with them. He said, you know, Anthony, we're looking for a non-Trinitarian church. Wow. I just keep very quiet. <laughs> oh, I said, come check us out one day. He never actually got round to it, but I know he doesn't like some churches. You know why? Because tithing is all they talk about. Give, give, give. And even they went, they visited the local Baptist church and went a couple of times. Didn't like it that much. But then they received a lot of envelopes, you know, to, to send the tithe in. They didn't like that. So we could have two neighbors coming to church with us. That's the way it works. And don't forget, though, some people hate you. Anthony, your narrow hips are going to burn in hell forever. I like that one. I put that on the fridge. <laughs> if that's the worst they can do for you, it's not much. Your brother Servetus, Miguel Servetus, was burned at the stake for some of the things we teach here. You know that. It's an awful world, isn't it? Satan, apparently, is the god of this age, right? You've got that right. Well, uh, don't tell that to a Christadelphian. They don't believe it. You could not go to fellowship with them. They won't have you in the communion service if you think that there's an external devil. You guys got work to do. There are millions of Christadelphians. And they think that you are the devil. The devil is human nature. So when Jesus in the wilderness <laughs> got the devil in all, all these twisted texts the devil brought along. Oh, it was just Jesus sticking this up himself. And you're smiling, but there are thousands of Christadelphians for whom this is a, a salvation issue, right? My point here is, is it's really chaos. So you're taking on a very noble task if you're going to do ministry, I think. Okay, that's demythologizing Boltmann. I said on the bottom of page 67, it's surprising that anyone could imagine that what survives this sophisticated attack i.e. no virgin birth, no resurrection. This sophisticated attack on the Christian doctrines is recognizably Christian when the pillars of the New Testament faith have been removed. Perhaps it is, as Oscar Wilde, the American human, uh, humorist, said cynically, truth in matters of religion is simply the opin opinion that survives, right? That's rather true. Whatever is valid. I like that last sentence. Good line. The, the one right after. Oh, it's, well, for me, I'm just a naive person. If it isn't simple, me, forget it. If it's parsing Greek words or arguing endlessly about it, I mean, it's just, just it's tiring. It's tiring. <laughs> don't forget Daniel 7. The Antichrist wears down the saints. Don't let somebody wear you down, right? And that's such a clever way to do it, too. It is. Daniel 7, what? Daniel 7, let's look it up. Could you use your... 
wonderful machine. What's the looking Daniel 7? Google search Daniel 7. <laughs> Searching Google for Daniel 7. What? Kind of an effeminate voice. I don't like that one. Oh, yeah, yeah you can change it. <laughs> Give me you a British accent. Yeah, yeah, you can get a British mail. Okay, we'll find the verse in Daniel 7, which speaks of wearing down the saints. Daniel chapter 7, one of the most important chapters. Is Daniel 7, the Antichrist, the beast and all that, let's see. Where have we got it? It's a... Uh Where's down the saints? I just saw it. Let's see. Is it verse 21? 21, I kept looking at what was waging war with the saints. It's the same sort of idea. But there's one where it says that he is wearing them down. I don't know. My eye doesn't fall on it. I thought I just... I'm not familiar. I'm just not familiar. Okay, so people search uh, wearing down the saints. Yeah, well, that might be my paraphrase, but it's, that's the right idea. We'll find it. Why do I say chapter 7 is so important? Because Son of Man is Jesus' favorite title, you know that? The human being. The Son of Man. He sees his career there, and he sees your career there. So we'll just, while we're there, remind ourselves of verse 18, 22, and 27. Oh, there we go. It's 7 verse 25. 25. 25. 25. He will speak out. This is the little horn, the Antichrist figure. Against the Most High, is God, and wear down, Nathan and the rest of you here, wear you out with pointless arguments, right? Exhaust you. Be careful. So that's verse 25. And then uh, the saints are given into his hand. They, they come under his uh, rule for, for a while, but it's only for three and a half years. That is another subject, how Jesus deals with the three and a half years. Okay, but back to 18. The saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. That's you. God is going to very graciously give you the world to manage. 19. And then I decide, Daniel, to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which for me is a Middle Eastern, not Rome, I think, but a Middle Eastern Assyrian conglomeration of ten nations, Psalm 83, another subject, but it's probably a Middle Eastern thing. All those are Babylonian kingdoms, by the way. They all stand on one, one image. So, uh, one image, rather. And the meaning of the ten horns, so it ends with a confederation of ten that on its head, and the other horn, there's an eleventh one alongside the ten. I kept looking, verse 21, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. So that's a future thing, but the spirit of Antichrist is still here. I mean, he's already here, you know that. There's a final Antichrist who does all of this. But for right now, the spirit of Antichrist is what you're up against. I kept looking, 22, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was passed in favor of the saints. That's you. Judgment in favor of you. Saints of the highest one. And the time arrived, so we're still in time. It's not timeless, it's not beyond time, the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Let's argue about that, let's not. That's easy, right? Blessed are the meek, they're going to possess the earth, the land. God wants to give you the kingdom. Fear not the flock, Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast, this fourth final nation, will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms. And it's going to devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. Is this ISIS? I don't know. And I don't know where we are in the scheme, but some horrible concrete system. As for the ten horns out of this final kingdom, there will be ten rulers, and then another one, an eleventh one. That's the law. And he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three. So you will, you're left with eight. Then, right? You put eleven of them all together, it takes away three, so you've got down to seven or eight. And he speaks out against the Most High, and he exhausts the saints you see, of the highest 
one. He will intend to make alterations in time, scene, whatever that, calendar changes the calendar, whatever that is. They will be given into his hand for that period of three and a half years. But the court will sit for judgment and the Antichrist dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then, 27, the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven, I think that means on the earth, if I'm not mistaken, certainly not in heaven or anywhere else, on the earth, under the whole heaven, will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. Their kingdom is the correct translation, not his there, but their kingdom is, is darker than your some translations that you see. Their kingdom, I speak it right, and others, their kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. Now watch this one. And all dominions will have to serve and obey them. Ooh. Mean we're all going to have to serve and obey. So it's, so it's like third come compared to it's, it's actually the point is it's the people of the saints. And the people are singular dramatically, but it's, uh, it's um, collective a collective number of people there. The point would be that back in 22, the time comes when the saints possess the kingdom. And that's the point where all nations have to serve and obey them. And plus with some of your commentaries on that. That makes better sense. Okay, that's that then. Let's leave that alone. And you wrote on that very nicely. And I'll give you back another break in just a second. Get these back. Nathan Massey, right. I said at the top here, this is the narrative of guaranteed success. I like this narrative idea. It's a plot line. Right? I didn't get this in church. I'm part of a, of a scheme. It's not just me and my salvation. It's that too. But God has a huge thing going here. I love that. Especially as I get older, I go out and the birds sing to me in the morning. I think I'm going crazy. I'm not. The bird song is phenomenal. Where I am. What? Who caused that little thing to do that? How, how did that happen? I was watching squirrels yesterday. I was watching, not for hours and hours, just for <laughs> <laughs> And uh, these tiny birds, I don't know what they are, but they sit on top of various things that Barbara has in her garden. They sit they perch there, and then one perches right there, and then they fly away. Hmm, how did that happen? See, I'm getting to see now, that's what I'm saying. But that's, that's the creation that I think is so marvelous. So I, I think you understood the narrative, right? The plot line. People love a good story. As pastors, teachers, you must give them the sense of being part of the grand scheme. Mm -hmm. Not just, well, if I'm just good enough, I'll fly up to heaven and do who knows what on a pink cloud in the sky. That's not going to grab their attention. But God is graciously letting you see what he's up to from the beginning onwards. I think that makes the Bible exciting. So then you did your famous 321, Apocatastasis, and I put in... Acts 1 6 goes with it, right? Is this mm -hmm. the time to apocatistanis, uh, restore the kingdom? To Israel. 321. Isn't that beautiful? Preach on that because people don't know that stuff well, I think. So I had the Acts 1 6 there. Then you've got the devil. I, I dared to put a capital D on there, probably better. The devil. There's no such thing as devils, that's the King James error. There's no plural devils. Uh, those are demons. Demonia is a different word. Demonia. And we mentioned earlier, Joe, about the certain denomination that says that there are no such things. And this is quite clear. He's the God and ruler of this age. Second Corinthians 4.4. 4. I just stuck the verses just to remind you. You know. And then uh, I refer to Ephesians 6, which says that our struggle daily is not essentially against flesh and blood. Mm. Other human beings. I mean, it's against that too. Especially if people are going to be the agents of the devil who are struggling with human beings. I see that. But it is essentially against cosmocrats. I love that word, cosmocrats. Cosmo with a K. That's the Greek, cosmokratores. Spiritual wickedness in high places, right? Demonic forces. That's what we're up against. I think that makes our task very challenging. Who was the... Somebody came and preached in chapel about being Navy SEALs, remember that? I think the guy used to be in South Carolina. Mm. He said, you guys are all Navy SEALs. Your God's cutting edge. We are. We better take this very seriously. And not to the point of being morose, obviously, because I think life is a lot of fun. Joe and I are having fun, you know. Paul told Timothy, don't get entangled right. 
Yes. With this system, Absolutely. we're kingdom citizens. That's right. <coughs> First interest. Is right. It's a command for us to be happy always. <laughs> yes. I like that. I, Bill will tell him about that cosmocrat. Let me write up. Yeah. Mind you. It's a good way. It's, it's the Greek there in Ephesians 6. Cosmocrat. Democrat, aristocrat, you've heard of them. Well, these are rulers of the cosmos. I got to thinking, you know, God in Jeremiah 27, 5, we've mentioned a number of times, it says God wants to give the world to whoever he thinks he'll give it to. That's his privilege. But Satan said that to Jesus, didn't he? If you'll just worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms, he said. Satan said that. Because he has a measure of control, always under God's permission. Christadelphian people cannot understand that. They say, oh, you believe in more than one God then, because you've got the true God, then you've got another God. No, no, no. <coughs> they're talking about an evil fallen angel. So you always use the text in 1 Timothy 3, where it says that Satan fell into condemnation. Right? That's a very good one. He wasn't created evil. God did not create this evil person and then punish him for being evil. That's cruel. He fell into evil. Perhaps, as Mark Madison, the relative of Joe's, used to say, and this may be right, it may be that when Satan saw Adam in the garden, that's when he got mad. Hmm. That's the Jewish... I, I, I don't insist on that. It may be. It's a nice idea. He watched this amazing creation, Adam and Eve, right? And he knew that man was going to be superior to the angels. In Jesus, ultimately, he's superior to all the angels. He got so hopping, man, he said, I'll fix this. I'll, I'll mess this thing up. And look at the result he's working at. That's good stuff. I believe you actually believe this, don't you? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> we're going on a very good show. It's good stuff. We'll start doing, and we get towards three weeks before the end, we'll start putting grades on my But you're, you're doing well. So, Mr. Grant, if you could just have a little heading, a little bit more presentation here, ideally. Uh, just, it's easy to read. Sure. But you, you're doing well. Um, you didn't mention, you could have mentioned, you've got either Satan has disappeared, gotten lazy. I like your humor. Perhaps Satan just got lazy. No, he's intentional and aggressive. I have to remind myself of that. And you have acknowledged, I uh, see. Yet in the New Testament, we see a plethora, I'm showing off his long words here. I expect how much one is done. A plethora means a lot, <clears throat> a lot of things, a plethora, of fullness. That's a good word. A plethora of acknowledged an open and engaged demonic activity, more than in Africa, I think, more obvious, but who knows, the doctrines of demons are probably just as active here. And again, my, my life is, is, is around this. Right in Australia, they're running into uh, preterism. They're beginning to say the second coming all happened in 1780. It's mass chaos. So if somebody doesn't try to help them out, no, you know, somebody's got to help them. We need to keep people sane and sound. Very difficult to think the second coming was in 70 AD. That's full preterism. Anyway, there's lots of work out there. All right, some may not call you this. What was it? Oh yeah, you talked about, <laughs> I'm a brother to anybody. That's, that's generous. You're a brother to anybody who loves Jesus and so on. That's great. And I, from my own experience, I said, some of them are not necessarily going to call you that, right? You may want to call them that. Anthony on narrow hips are going to burn and help out. I wasn't quite sure whether he was in or my brother. That particular one, that, that's not so. That's fine. And then Grace, nice clear presentation here. And you have repentance may at first seem painful because it's hard to give up certain sins, and I said, or errors. Not just, oh, I'm a drunk, you know, I'm not going to be a drunk. I've been beating my wife, I better stop doing that. Maybe I didn't quite get God clear from the start, or maybe Jesus then I have to say, oh God, the Bible prayer, oh God, open my eyes, send some kind of person to undeceive me if I'm deceived. We've tried to do that over the years. But you, you write very well. Then the time when God will restore everything, that's his apokatastasis that you trot out, 321 of Acts. Matthew 22, the Pharisees asked their question, then Jesus turned the table on, very nice, he turned the table on them, and asked a penetrating question. You're a bit of a writer. You like to write. It's great. Very nice. Uh, who they thought the Messiah was. See, that, that's not a have, have a happy marriage text, is it? Jesus said, now, let me ask you a real question. Here. Who is the Messiah? And he quotes Psalm 110. We went through it. That's a quote doctrine. Right? Awful word doctrine, right? 
That counts very much. Jesus was going to make sure they understood. He's a teacher. They need to know who the Messiah is. Is he really Michael the Archangel? Is he fully God, second member of the God family? And these things are for Jesus, apparently very important. So you refer to that. And the Pharisees, as you rightly said, knew that the Messiah would be a descendant of David. They did not understand him to be God exactly, but that, that's a big question, but needs to be wrestled with. Who is God and who is Jesus? Okay. And then I throw in the Adoni word. Um, Anna here has some Jewish friends in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, so when they come, which is not often, infrequently, seldom, seldom, she's going to say to the student, now ask you a question, please. Mm, do you know, I'm, I'm in the Bible college. The professor told me about Adonai and Adonai. What's the difference between Adonai and Adonai? Let's see. Don't be silly. Adonai. Oh, your husband is Adonai. You, you get a nice reaction. Okay, you left your grace. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. And Anna, you write nicely. You use quite a lot of my languages. It's fine. No, that's fine. I mean, why not? You might as well because it's 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 you know. Master. Acts one six. You did very nicely. And you talked about Messiah, right? God's anointed King. Daniel nine. They're going to be um, sixty nine weeks. You know that prophecy. It's called the Dismal Swamp of Bible Prophecy in the commentaries because it's so confused. Not really that hard. But Daniel is told there'll be so many years until the coming of Mashiach Nagid, Messiah Lord, Messiah Prince. Anointed Lord, that's helpful for your people. If you're telling them that Jesus is the Christ, you quickly tell them that he's the anointed one. Well, priests and others were anointed in the Old Testament. Who was a pagan ruler who was a messiah? Cyrus. Right? He was an anointed one. God used him as a tool. He certainly wasn't God. So when they heard about Mashiach, Nagid, they weren't thinking another God. They're thinking of a descendant of David who was anointed. If you say anointed, then it takes you to Luke 2.11. I love this because that's where Luke introduces him. Luke 2.11, uh, he's the Mashiach, Nagid. He's the Christos Kyrios, in that order. The Messiah Lord, right? In your translation, the Lord Messiah, not quite clear. He's the Mashiach <coughs> Lord. The Christos Lord, you see? The Christ Lord. Then people won't think, well, he's just another Yahweh. That's not so easy. Because nobody thought anointed God made any sense. I don't think God gets anointed, but the one being born there was an anointed Lord. It's only, I only saw that recently. I, I find Luke just terribly fascinating. We mentioned earlier Luke 1.43, isn't it great that the mother of my Lord, that's Adonai from Psalm 101, the mother of my Lord has come to see me. She's so thrilled. You know, they had, it's, it's interesting, I guess I have a little bit more of this from the British system, but there is a great honor due to kings. <coughs> you have it here, you have this admiration in America too, for the British system to that extent. Americans are very interested in Prince William and, and all that stuff. Not that they aren't also over there. I get this very much in Samuel, first, 20, uh, first Samuel 25, where Abigail, who later became a wife of David, remember after Nabal, she was married to an idiot, and she said that. My husband's a fool. So he dies of a heart attack, getting drunk, right? He's gone. And she comes, and she falls on her knees before the poor David, gets off her donkey, got a whole troop of maidens behind her carrying wine and gifts, and he gets off it and prostrates herself. Not that we do that now exactly, but they have a sense that God is working in, in the Messiah there. We better pay attention. I, I think we don't we don't always fully grasp that. Okay, you're doing well. It's great. This is, uh, ah, no. You need to take a break. We've gone too long. Sorry, take a break. <laughs>